short this morning. Come on in. <laughs> Opening scripture this morning is coming from Psalm 68:18. Psalm 68:18. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your captives in your train. And receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of giving to us. We thank you for your son Jesus for coming to this earth to live an example, live a life, an example for us. Thank you for his awesome sacrifice. That he is alive and sitting at your right hand. Father, we ask that you forgive us for our sins. You know, we do fail, we are. We pray that you would be with us as we go through the service. We may do things and say things that be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, pray. Amen. First song this morning is number 610, and then we'll transition right on over to 611. If I didn't do that, probably people would just have a <laughs> shock heart attack or something. But anyway. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, on heard I go. Closely to Him I cling, blessings will flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I love my Savior too. Singing his 
praises, quietly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. if you're in the book. My <coughs> Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely understand because he cares my Jesus knows just what I need oh yes he knows just what I need he satisfies and every need supplies yes he knows just what I knows when I am burdened. He knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Skies are dark when hope is gone. My faith I feel is arms about me and hear him say, You're not alone. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what. so old school, I don't know. It's like teaching an old dog a new trick. <laughs> Let's stand for this song, please. I'd like to stay here longer than the allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, living by and by. I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, there no more, Lord, to, to die. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, by and by. I want to be of service along this pilgrim way, and lead the lost to Jesus, as fervently I pray. As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh, and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, living by and by. 
I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, there no more Lord to die. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, be by and by. The end I know is nearing, my faith I love go away. Yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I cling to him forever, and look beyond the sky, and live with him forever, in glory by and by. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story about on high. There with my dear Redeemer, there no more Lord to die. Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Please be seated. What? One right. Oh, I tell you, getting up this morning. <laughs> Wee bit chilly. Oh my. I mean, even, even, well, I left the house around 8.30 or 8.35 or so, and it was still 29 degrees. I don't know how cold it is out there right now, but 29 degrees at 8.30? I'm not ready for that yet. I don't know about you, but I mean, yeah, Thanksgiving is this week, so I need to get ready for it, but... It is what it is. I saw, I saw, I hate, I hate keeping the going, I hate to keep going back to Facebook, but I, I saw something on Facebook. Don't complain about the snow, because it'll just make you feel miserable, and the snow will still be there. <laughs> just deal with it. And I say that because I still have snow in my front yard. I don't know about you, but I still have snow in my front yard. It's well insulated. It's on top of the leaves, so. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I, I got asked this morning about Marie. Um, I got a message from her about the time we started saying that they are driving north already. They were in Baltimore when they messaged, so they were planning on listening as they drive. So everything's working and she is listening right now. Um, I won't say anything embarrassing. <laughs> um, so they should be up here by before Wednesday. They're going to travel as far as Connecticut and then pick up Carolyn and finish the trip either tomorrow or the next day, one or the other, depending on how much they need to rest. <laughs> Oh, let's see, what else is going on? Someone snack tonight. Someone snack today at 3 o'clock. Yes. Uh, I got a, uh, a note about Sam. Sam had shoulder surgery on Friday. He had a bone spur removed and two tendons relocated. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the procedure went well. Uh, he is down in Brunswick today for his brother's funeral. So we need to keep him in our prayers. Um, let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning, for this time that we've set aside to, to worship you and sing songs of praise, to encourage one another and to learn from your word. Father, be with those who aren't with us today. Be with Marie as she's driving back up. Be with Sam as he's down in Brunswick and attending his brother's funeral. Be with his family. Help them through their difficult time. Father, help us all through these challenging times that we've been facing over the past several years. Father, be with me during this time that I present this message that I've prepared. I just pray that, I pray that I speak your words in spite of my weakness and that your message shines through. 
Father, most of all, I thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. I think most of you know that I spent more than 20 years in the Air Force. My, my last job in the Air Force was actually teaching ROTC at the University of Maryland in College Park. And once in a while, I'll wear my turf tie. It's uh, not very often, but I do, I do wear it on occasion. Now, one of the things that we had to do as officers at the ROTC detachment was evaluate the four-year scholarship applicants. The students would apply for the scholarship, and they, they would include a resume of their accomplishments during their time in high school. One of the things that we looked for was indicators of the students being responsible for things that were unusual for people of their age. For instance, male applicants, we looked for, we looked for students who achieved a reasonably high rank in Boy Scouts, and Eagle Scouts were, yeah, you can't get any higher than Eagle. And the Eagle Project, what they actually did on their Eagle project is also important to look at. That's usually a sign that they're willing to take on a lot of responsibility and at least had some leadership potential and experience. We also looked at social responsibility, like volunteering their time for to support some selfless cause or something along those lines. Now looking back at most of the scholarship students that we had that I can remember, Many of them have actually done pretty well during their time in the Air Force, and, and many of them remain in the Air Force today. Uh, I hate to say this, but around 15 years later, yeah, it's getting, it's getting there. I guess they're probably going to stay for 20. I mean, if they stayed for 15, they're going to stay five more years. We'll see. I think we all have the potential to do well in most situations. Not all of us are cut out for everything, though. I mean, not everyone has to go to college after high school. You don't need to go to college to do well in life. We're all different. We all have different abilities, different strengths, and different weaknesses. I was always good in math and science in school, but sports? Sports was never my strong suit. Others excelled at the physical things, but didn't do well in the classroom. But they made it through, and now most are excelling in their chosen careers. Like I said, we're all different. God made us all different. We all have different roles to play in life. God has a plan for all of us. And we need to take the time to listen to him, to learn what he wants us to to do. As we move into chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the congregations in Ephesus and throughout the Roman province of Asia, Paul is transitioning from his discussion of the spiritual aspects and consequences of following Jesus as Messiah to the more mundane, shall we say, the mundane things in life, how we should live our lives and how we should interact with other people. Start in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul had revealed his current condition in the beginning of chapter 3. Up to that point in the letter, there is no mention of his imprisonment. In the previous chapter, chapter 3, Paul said the reason he was in prison was because he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. That's actually a pretty good summation of why he was there. If he had not been bringing the good news to the Gentiles, there wouldn't have been a ruckus raised at the temple when he returned to Jerusalem, and he would never have been arrested. And if he hadn't been arrested, 
he would never have had to appeal his trial to Caesar. Now, Paul appeals to his readers here to walk in a manner worthy of their calling. That is, be a true disciple of Christ. And Paul explains at a high level what he means by that. To be living our lives the way that we should as true disciples of Jesus, we should be humble, gentle, and patient, or the Greek word there actually literally translates to long-suffering. Living that way is not always easy. Sometimes it's okay, but many times situations make it nearly impossible to do all these things. But the whole concept that Paul is beginning to discuss here, and through most of the rest of this letter, is that we need to live our lives like Jesus did. That needs to be our goal. In Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke 6, verse 40, Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but... Everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, Jesus will always be above us. He will always be the head. But we need to learn to be like him in everything that we do. Our goal needs to be that when we are fully trained, we will be like him. Of course, the problem with that is the training is long, lifelong. We will continue to have opportunities to learn to be more like Jesus right up to the day we die. As we grow to be more like Jesus, behaving more like Jesus did every day, we should be working to ensure that all of our brothers and sisters are showing love for each other and growing to be more like Jesus and growing more united every day. That's what Paul means when he writes, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The result of our spiritual growth to be more like Jesus will have physical evidence. People will see that we are more humble, more patient, more gentle, and more encouraging others. One of the main points that Paul makes in the first half of his letter is that God had a plan, and that that plan was to reconcile all of mankind to him through Christ. Not just the Jews who had turned away from the truth, but all of mankind, so that together we can all be one body, one united temple for his spirit here on the earth. And now, it reinforces that concept. Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 7. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul points out seven things that should bring us all together as Christians. First, that we are one body, as he pointed out previously by saying that we are all each individually being included in, building, in the building of the temple of God's spirit. And that's the second thing. Although we are all individuals, those of us who are baptized into Christ's death have his spirit in us. One spirit in all of us. We all share the hope of eternal life with him in heaven. That's the promise that he made. And we have faith that he will keep his promise. There is one Lord, Jesus. There is one faith that we all have in him, and we're all buried with him in one simple act of being immersed in water. 
one baptism. And over and above all that, there is one God. That Paul wrote back in the end of chapter 3, that he is the source of the name of every family. He is the key to all existence. But even with all that unity and oneness, we're each unique. Because God's grace is supplied to each one of us in a way that is exactly how we need it. And that's different for all of us. God's grace, what he gives to me that I don't deserve, is different than it is for you. Even though the concept is the same. Because we are all different. His gift to each of us is unique because we are not the same. So now Paul supports his argument by quoting from Psalms, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now Paul's quoting from Psalm 68 here. That's, that's why I had Psalm 68, 18 as the opening scripture this morning. But what's Paul's point here? I'll start with the parenthetical part, which actually starts in verse 9. Paul is clarifying what David wrote about the Lord ascending. When David wrote this psalm, of course, the tabernacle was standing on a hill because that was a place of honor. When David wanted to build the temple for God, and when Solomon did finally build that temple, it was built on the highest ground around. Ascending to the temple was getting you physically and spiritually closer to God. Now, when Jesus ascended after living his life here in the lower regions here on earth, he did something. First, he led the way for us to follow him. Paul describes Christ in his letter to Colossae as the firstborn from the dead. The writer of Hebrews calls him the founder or pioneer of our salvation. Christ is the one leading the way for us to be in heaven with him, leading a host of captives. But he also provided gifts to all of us. Not parting gifts like you get from a game show, but gifts to help us to do the work that God has set out for us and also to help each other. Let's keep reading in Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. <clears throat> and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Just as Paul prayed in the end of chapter 3 that we would all be filled with the fullness of God, God sent specific gifts to specific people to be able to help us to be filled with his fullness. That is, to grow up as Christians to live our lives like Jesus. Paul gives four examples of gifts that God gave to specific people to be able to lead us to grow up to be like Jesus. Now, some would argue that, that there are five, but I think the last two are linked together because the definite article, the, is missing in the Greek on the fifth term. So to me, that make, means the fourth and fifth terms are tied together. So Paul lists apostles as the first gift that God gave us. 
his called out people. That's a very specific group of people. If you look back at Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascends, the 11 that are left decided that they needed to select a replacement for Judas because Judas had committed suicide. But the criteria for selection was very specific. Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time when the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So even in the eyes of the eleven, to be a true apostle of Jesus, you had to have been with Jesus from the beginning to be a witness to his resurrection. Now, Paul doesn't meet these criteria, but he fits the definition of the Greek word for apostle, one who is sent with a purpose. But he does fit that last piece, that he was a witness to his resurrection, having met Jesus on the road to Damascus. So, now the next gift that God gave us, the church, is called out people. The next gift is the prophets. Now these, I think, as opposed to the prophets that Paul referred to earlier as the foundation of God's temple of believers, these are the first century prophets. These are the people who verified God's word to believers and spoke God's truth to them. The third gift from God is evangelists. We use this word a lot. But this word is actually only used three times in the New Testament. And only you, you can only find it once in <clears throat> secular ancient Greek writings. But we do know that the root word for the term is the word that we translate as gospel. An evangelist is one who brings the good news of Jesus to people. In a way, we should all be doing this. But there are those who are so much better at it than others because of their gift. And the final gift is the double one that I was talking about earlier. Paul lists shepherds or pastors, depending on your translation, and teachers as a gift. Like all the others, Paul includes both the skill to do it and the people who do it as the gift from God. The way I see it, these two gifts go together. Shepherds teach in order to lead the flock. It's just how it works. Paul wrote to the congregation in Corinth about gifts and unity as well. It's possible that some of the people in Corinth were prioritizing different gifts, saying that some were more important than others. And Paul was trying to level the playing field, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God sent his spirit to implement gifts as needed in his people for the common good. And Paul points out three categories of these manifestations of the spirit. Gifts, service or ministry, and activities or work. How do we reconcile these three groups that Paul writes to the Corinthians congregation about? Well, the way I look at it, the gifts are the abilities that God gives us to be able to do different acts of service or ministries and different activities or works. But God provides 
those ministries and works for us to do using the gifts that he gives us. I know, I know, it sounds like a big circle. But there's a purpose behind why God does things. God doesn't just do them. He does things for a reason. So later on in the same letter to Corinth, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 28. And God has apportioned in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Do all teach? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, the beginning of this list is similar to what we read in Ephesians 4.11. And it's even a similar order. Apostles, prophets, and then teachers. Here in the letter of Corinth, he leaves out evangelists. But Paul is using this as a different list to make a different point. All these gifts that Paul includes here and in other places where he lists different gifts are given to individuals among God's called out people, his church, for a purpose. They all have a purpose. They don't just happen, and not everyone has the same ability for God. So, I'm going to use myself as an example. I don't remember who said it, but recently, within the past couple of months, I remember someone saying to me jokingly that it was unfair that God would have the same person be able to sing well and also be a good teacher. <laughs> I would argue that God hasn't done either of those in me, but maybe I'm just trying to be humble. I don't know. Either way, I don't know, I do know that God has taught me how to do research on a subject and be able to present that information in a way that people can generally understand the point that I'm trying to get across. Is that what Paul is writing about when he says the gift of teaching? I don't know, maybe. But like I said, all of these gifts from God are given for a specific purpose. They are used to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. They are given to produce a positive outcome, to not just equip and build up, but to strengthen and mature his called out people so they in turn can go out and use their gifts to help other people. What does a strong, mature Christian look like? Well, I think we started with that, didn't we? Walking in a manner worthy of our calling. A strong, mature Christian looks like Jesus. They strive to live their life like Jesus did. Remember the, maybe you don't remember, but do you remember the bracelets back in the 90s? I, I had one. It said WWJD on it means what would Jesus do? And they were supposed to remind you to live your life and respond to situations the way that Jesus would. In other words, grow up to be like Jesus instead of jumping around and latching onto the current doctrine of the month that somebody is pushing. So here's Paul's remedy to that in Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined to, and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, and when, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Instead of being led astray by the doctrine of the month, we need to be mature and grow up to be like Jesus. Paul uses the same analogy here that he uses in his letter to Corinth about the church being a body. 
just like he compared the church to a temple earlier in this letter. But here Paul says the head of the church is Christ. And just like in English, that can mean the physical head, like what we have on our shoulders, and the leader of a group or organization. Christ is the leader of his called out people, his church. He is the one who makes the rules and sets the direction of the organization. And our goal as his disciples is to strive to become just like him. Live our lives like him. React to situations the way that he would react. When we become mature, and live our lives like Jesus would, then we will encourage each other, speaking his truth in love to each other and everybody else. And as a body of his called out people, we will function properly together. Now, growing up, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was, I know, a lot of people look at me funny when I say this, but in eighth grade. I knew in eighth grade that I wanted to work with computers. I guess I'm not really doing that now, but... And honestly, that was a long time before home computers were a thing, just to give you a frame of reference here. And it, people would just look funny at me when I said that. But God had given me the ability to be good at both math and science. And that lent itself to being good with computers. He made it so that I could learn things quickly. And now he is using that gift that he gave me to help me bring these messages to you. We all have gifts. Sometimes it takes us 50 years to figure out what those gifts are and how to use them the way that God wants us to, but we all have gifts. The biggest gift that God has given to anybody is the gift of salvation. He sent his son to die because of our sins. And his blood covers those sins. You can accept his gift of salvation if you believe Jesus died for your sins and you're willing to turn away from them. And then you can be immersed in water, baptized to wash away those sins, and you can start your new life, working towards doing God's will. If you want to know more about that, or if there's something that we can help you with, come talk to me. Let's stand together.
He paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. think about that song. Um, all I can think of is uh, financial freedom. And, and, it's, and when Paul writes about it, he uses accounting terminology, talking about how we're in the red when it comes to our relationship with God. And the sacrifice of Jesus lines out that red in the ledger. It just crosses it off so that that debt is forgiven. I mean, Jesus tells several parables about forgiving financial debt to people. He was trying to prepare them for what he was about to do for everybody. Let's pray.
pray for the bread. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross as a payment for our sins. We thank you for this bread that reminds us of his body on the cross. We pray that we can live our lives in a manner worthy of your calling. In Jesus' name. The writer of Hebrews says that there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And he's quoting that from, I think it's coming from Leviticus. I need to check and make sure again so that I have that in my head. But there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus' death on the cross as the focal point for forgiveness of sin because his blood was shed to pay our debt. His blood was shed in our place. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Father, I thank you for this fruit of the vine. How it reminds us of your son's blood that was shed for us on the cross. Father, we thank you for his death. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Sixty-four. <clears throat> That's in his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died. Read. 
us with more than we need. He gives us, he gives us what we need and more. So this is our opportunity to give back to him. Give back to the work that we do here to encourage others to follow him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for everything that you give to us and everything that you do for us, Father. Father, we pray that we can give back with a cheerful heart, that we can use these funds wisely to encourage others to follow you. In Jesus' name. Sam. Um, as I said, Sam had his surgery on Friday, Thursday. It was on Thursday. I thought it was on Friday. He had his surgery on Thursday. They removed a bone spur and relocated two tendons um, with no issues. So he's recovering, but we also need to be praying for him as he's at his brother's funeral today. Um, like I said, Marie and Gladys are driving up from Virginia. Let's see, they were in Baltimore an hour ago. They're probably just a little bit north of Baltimore. <laughs> They're probably almost at the New Jersey Turnpike because it's Sunday morning traffic isn't that bad. Yeah. Um, yet. <laughs> yet. Um, I'm going to get a text message. She's going to say, no, we weren't. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I put out a one call earlier this week about uh, Phoebe's brother's partner, Lorraine, in the hospital. So we need to be continuing to pray for her. She has a malignant brain tumor and it's impinging on her ability to walk right now. I don't know what the plan is for what they're going to do, but we need to be praying for her and all the doctors and nurses and, and all family as well. Um, we have a sing and snack scheduled for this afternoon at three o'clock. So 
we'll talk about that. Let me know if you're going to be here. Um, along the same lines, our midweek Bible study will be Wednesday at 3 o'clock, the day before Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thursday's Thanksgiving. It's like, where, how, where did that come from? It just snuck up on me. But Thursday's Thanksgiving. Um, next Sunday, the 27th, is potluck. So please remember that. And please be here to share in the food and the fellowship that goes along with that. Um, we have a work day scheduled for December 10th. So put that on your calendar. And if you can be here sometime other than that, talk to David, talk to me. We will open the building if you can't open the building and you want to do some work. Because there's a lot of work to be done downstairs. Um, and it's, it's being planned and organized, so. Oh, uh, what else do we need to be concerned about? Oh, I skipped the Ladies' Fellowship on December 3rd, the first Saturday of the month, starting at 9.30 in the morning here at the building. Ladies' Fellowship, December 3rd. Um, anything else we need to mention? Uh, I guess prayers for me because I'm in the preliminary uh, stages of working on a major project here in the state. So, could be big. Dealing with state bureaucracy also. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. And, and from, from, I don't is this the project that we've talked about? Yeah, I just want to. Yeah. <laughs> it is a big deal. So, definitely be praying for Jonathan as he works on this major project with the state. Um, anything else? Closing scripture is coming from Hebrews chapter 12, the first two verses. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you for all the blessings that you give to us, Father. You do so much for us. You give us so much. Father, help us to share those blessings with others. Help us to forgive others the way that you forgive us. Help us to encourage others to turn to you. Help us throughout this week, Father, to be a good example of Jesus to the world. Help us to be truly thankful for all the blessings that you have given to us. Protect us from harm, Father, and from the evil one. Help us to do what's right. In Jesus' name.